the last day, and uh, and I'm going to try to uh, make it as painful as possible, uh, <laughs> you know, to pay you back for your persistence. But uh, but so no, this is sort of the the last you know part of the of the course. You know, everything that we have done until yesterday is fundamentally linked to the life safety part of the problem, you know, until the point where you get, you know, to uh, flash over, okay? Now, what we're going to be talking about today is about uh, not structural behavior, but how can we actually deliver the appropriate boundary condition for a structural engineer to be able to do a structural design, okay? And there is two fundamental aspects to that is understanding what is the scenario that we are working with, okay? And the second part of it is try to quantify that scenario in as effective of a manner as possible, okay? So to get started, I mean, I need to have that conversation because effectively you have to tell me what are the fires that we should be modeling. So if I am interested in assessing the performance of a structure, so basically, this is structural performance assessment. That's the objective. So what should I, what are the fires that I'm supposed to be addressing? Yep. Okay, so clearly, you know, we do have that scenario of the post flashover. Okay, that we characterized as being this event that effectively involves the entire compartment, has a fairly high temperature, much, much higher than the growth period, okay? And, uh, and clearly it's going to last for a very long period of time because you have to burn all the fuel, okay? And that effectively represents the baseline scenario. So uh, when I turn off the lights, but you can see the post flashover compartment fire is going to be at the core of what we're doing. Okay. Now, nowadays uh, we have gone, or at least attempted, to become a bit more sophisticated. Okay, and we used to deal with this problem purely from the perspective of addressing the post flashover uh, fire as being the only realistic threat that a structure can have. Now, are there any other design fires I should be considering? You could consider localized fires, no? Okay, so you are discussing the effect of localized fires. So what is a localized fire? Okay, in other words, it establishes itself in a position where effectively heats up locally, okay? An element of the structure or part of the structure. Okay, why is that relevant? The time scales can be a lot longer than Why? But why? Why? I mean, if it involves the entire compartment, the fuel is going to be burning along the entire compartment. But locally, you only have a certain amount of fuel. So that fuel will eventually consume itself, independent of the fact that it might be a localized fire or it might be a fully developed compartment fire. Now, we talked about a lot about burning rates. And obviously, there will be a difference, potentially, between the burning rate of a fully developed fire that might be higher than the burning rate of a localized, let's say, pool type of fire. But the differences in burning rate are not going to be that significant. So fundamentally, a localized fire will probably burn maybe a little bit longer than what a fully developed fire will burn because of the lesser feedback that is getting so less burning rate. But it will not be something that I will say triple, quadruple, or very significant. It's just simply a nuance associated to how the feedback is happening you know, with, within the, the context of the compartment. So, yeah.
So, so you think that, that, let's say that I have a structural system. So imagine you know, this being a floor. Okay, you have the core at this point, okay? And uh, span, so you have a column one, column two, column three, column four. So what you're saying is that if I was to put a fire in a certain location, the gradients of temperature that are going to occur are going to have an effect that could potentially be very significant, despite the fact that it's quite local. But would that effect actually propagate beyond that region? I mean, it might deform some areas, but would it actually have an impact of such magnitude that could potentially lead to a severe damage of the structure? Why? But, but yeah, I mean, we, we can say, yes, I think so. But keep in mind that if I introduce another design criteria and I have to evaluate that design criteria, I need to have some very good reasons you know, for the expenditure. OK? So why would that be the case? So yeah. So for example, if one column is just quite hot, then yep. that means the other column would be able to respond appropriately. Uh, that's a very interesting point. So. Uh, so basically what you're saying is that if one column fails, effectively you have to redistribute that load. You need to build in redundancy. Yeah, but don't you do that anyway when you do structural analysis? I mean structures, I mean road and point. So how many of you have a structural engineering background? Okay, so you will know what road and point is. <laughs> so so road and, road, road and point was a failure that effectively what happened was a kitchen, and it was a small kitchen explosion, okay? And that small kitchen explosion effectively blew out one column, okay? And the moment it blew out a column, it induced progressive collapse of a fourth of the building, okay? So that forced people to start looking at structures in a completely different way. So effectively, structures have to have elements of redundancy in such a way that you redistribute the load into other different areas. So in principle, any structure would be subject in one indirect or direct way to an elimination analysis, which is effectively you, you are capable of removing any individual element of the structure. And the structure in principle might deform, but it will not induce any form of progressive collapse. Yeah. Can you repeat the term that you just used? Progressive collapse? No, no, no. Uh, Ronan. Ronan Point. So, so Ronan Point is the name of a building. Okay. And effectively, what it was, if you look at the floor plan of the building, um, you know, it was a, a very small residential uh, high rise, and uh, in one of the corners, so there was a balcony in here, and the balcony had a kitchen in here. So it's a small explosion here, and this column failed, okay? And the moment that this column failed, all this part of the building pancaked down all the way to the ground because it had no redundancies. You know, it were precast concrete slabs that were put in there almost assembled, and, uh, and the moment you remove the column, everything just literally fell down. Now, we learned that lesson a long time ago, and we don't do that anymore. So we are very, very careful to enable redundancies when you put a building. So a column can fail in any building and there should be absolutely no major impact. So we should be able to eliminate individual structural elements, even sectors of the building. <coughs> and it is much easier with beams because in beams you can actually re eliminate numerous beams and still not have a, a, a major problem of progressive collapse. So in principle, if, if I'm talking about a localized fire, and a localized fire is going to eliminate a column, in theory, that is a problem, and it's a problem that I might want to address. But wouldn't it be just easier if I just eliminate the column and do an elimination analysis without doing any fire analysis? Why would I need to do the fire ahead of time if I can just simply check that if I eliminate that column, then the structure operates correctly. It leads to a failure in compensation. So for example, if that yeah, has um, other elements of the task where it would rely on that having maintaining its um, its capacity. So if, if that column collapses, you then have like a breach in the wall that's going to come out of like your scenario. 
Yes, but I mean, I think you, 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 can, you can always complicate the process as much as you want. But effectively, what is the failure of compartmentation? The failure of compartmentation is that the flames are going to go to the next compartment. But if you don't have a post flush over fire, that actually will help me because effectively you're releasing energy in other directions, so you're cooling down the, the, the whole place. So, so it is not really, the loss of compartmentation at this stage is really not that big of a problem in the sense that people in principle should not be there anymore. We're talking about structural integrity and we're talking about the later stages of the fire, not the growth period. Any. I mean, any other thoughts? I mean, should I be including a localized fire? I mean, you potentially want to do that, but if you think about it, there is never a thermal shock in the sense that it is actually a very slow heating process. You have a gas that has a density of one, heating a solid that has a density of 5,000, okay? So whatever is happening in the concrete or in the steel is gonna happen incredibly slow compared to what happens on the fire itself. So the heat wave is going to progress very, very slowly over the material. So while you might have some impact on the surface, that impact will not translate itself until much later on to the interior of the, of the structural element. and. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, there is the, the, the whole concept of the, of the thermal shock really doesn't apply in the sense that normally when we design structures, basically we design them as a function of the cross-section. So, you know, materials have, you know, a, a stress capacity, a yield strength, okay? Multiplied by the area gives you the force that the steel element or the concrete element can withstand. So effectively, you are gaining your strength by means of the entire surface area. So if you start losing very slowly the edges, you know, the time that you get before you affect the structure is extremely long compared to the kind of time scales that you will get heating in the gas phase, okay? So, so in principle, that will not work. Now, creep is a different story. I mean, are you familiar with the concept of creep? Yeah? So effectively, creep is something Oh, I have to take this off. Uh, so creep is something that we need to be uh, always considered as a material property because effectively if you put some sort of solicitation, that solicitation carries a memory that is going to keep happening you know, for a certain period of time. So potentially we do need to take into account that, but it is not only uh, a case of a localized fire. You know, creep is something that structural engineers sometimes will consider when analyzing this type of problems, okay? Just give me one second so I can get rid of this. Okay, so let's go back to the original question. Do I, I mean, do I actually need to treat localized fires? Yeah. No. Yeah, but if it's a less onerous condition, why am I even concerned? I mean, the point that I'm making is that a localized fire cannot be worse than me eliminating the structural element. So if I do a purely structural elimination analysis by which I remove the structural element from the system and I verify that there is no progressive collapse, Okay. then I would have fulfilled the function of guaranteeing the behavior of the system without necessarily having to do the fire and the heat transfer and all these other things that are necessary to heat up the material. And then the, if I was going to analyze the structure, then I'll have to do a nonlinear final element model. So you have all this analysis for a scenario that I have already considered when I did the elimination analysis. So a structural engineer that wants to have a structure that is redundant, that is robust, and is resilient, would have done all that exercise of doing the elimination analysis to make sure that there is no single point failures, okay? 
So they would have eliminated certain structural elements and showed that the redundancies are there. So why do I need to do more than that? That really is the question. Yes, the scenario can happen, but is that scenario one that is worth for me to consider? Yep. Uh, not from a structural perspective, because uh, the structural analysis would have taken the critical areas of the structure, the ones that have a, a utilization level that is highest, and they would have conducted this elimination analysis particularly for those zones, all the critical ones. When you say localized file, are you assuming by, by the name that it's not going to move to some, somewhere else? Like can we not yet. Yeah, no, I, I mean, of course, you can actually play with the field loads in ways that you are minimizing the potential solicitations on the structure. Now, normally playing with the field load is something that very few building developers or owners would want to have because it immediately limits the use of the building. So you have to be extremely careful before you actually put any requirements to do that. So what we normally try to do is we don't get to the management of the fuel load until we have exhausted every other option. So in reality, what you would like to make sure is that you guarantee that the structure behaves correctly, you know, no matter what distribution of fuel load you have. So what, what I was trying to get to is more about, as a fire engineer, do I, I need to make decisions of what are going to be my design fires. And as a function of those design fires, I'm going to solicit the structure, and that's the information that I need to provide the structural engineer. Now, if, if it so happens that once the structural engineer does their job, they found out that under many of my scenarios, the structure will fail, and they have no way to fix the structure in itself, then I do have to start resorting to things such as the reduction of the fuel load or moving the fuel load to certain places and so forth. And that actually does happen. So for example, many times you have buildings, particular commercial buildings like hotels, where you're going to have certain areas of the building that are used for storage purposes, where you actually have massive concentrations of fuel. Okay? And in those cases, you might actually, because of the amount of fuel that you have, you might induce uh, structural failure if you allow that space to burn. But, and in those cases, you might end up recommending to split you know, the storage facilities into different places to make sure that, uh, that you don't create concentrations of fuel. Okay? So, go back to my question. Is it actually worth doing localized fires? Not really, no. It's already contemplated within structural design. Okay? And eliminating the, the, the structural element ends up being a much, much more onerous and effective way of assessing if the structure has sufficient redundancies to cope with the loss of a series of structural elements. So if I'm going to address the concept of localized fires and I'm going to have a fire that is going to eliminate you know, column C3, what I'm going to do is eliminate column C3 and maybe eliminate this beam and eliminate uh, certain beams in here, okay, and basically check if effectively the structure can redistribute the loads. Okay? So localized fires are very easy uh, taken out of the picture by doing an elimination analysis. Yes, it's part of the design. Now, oh, most of the times they won't do it because they've already designed structures that they know are highly redundant. Okay? It, it is in cases where they know that they're potentially, like in the case of Ronan Point, that col column was in a corner, okay? and, uh, and the spans to the sides were a little bit too long. So effectively, those are the cases where uh, structural engineer will explicitly have to conduct an elimination analysis to make sure that the structure is robust. 
But in general, most structures are so redundant in nature that the elimination analysis is already almo almost already a de facto thing that has been, has been done during the design process. Yeah. No, no, very poor, and, and we, will, we will get there. So that, that is one of the biggest problems that we have, is that the fire engineers don't really understand very well what structural engineers are doing, and the structural engineers don't understand what fire engineers are doing. So when it comes to a situation where they are, you're designing design fires, okay, the fire engineer will design all the fires they think could potentially happen, independent of the fact that they are probably unnecessary for a structural analysis. Okay, and this is why I thought that this conversation was very important, because this is what generally happens. So the structural engineer will do their design, okay, they'll finish with the design, and, uh, and if there is some attempt to do some analysis of the structure for whatever reason, either because you want to eliminate fireproofing or because somebody has a concern about the structure, then they will come to the, structure, to the fire engineer and say, well, can you give me the design fires so I can test my structure? And then, in the blind, the fire engineer will go and say, well, you know, I want a post flash over fire here, 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 here. And I want localized fires in all these columns, okay? And, uh, and potentially other, other things. And then the structural engineer will get the inputs. They will go do their analysis, build the client a couple million dollars, you know, and then at the end of the story, they will come up to the conclusion that all these things were less than the analysis that they had already done. Okay, which is generally what tends to happen. So there's no communication between the parties, and the result is there's a lot of wasted time by everybody. And particularly, it's a lot of wasted time in the sense that uh, people are not doing things right. So you're doing all this analysis, and the analysis is actually incorrect by definition. So, so there's a lot of problems in the communication between structural engineers and fire engineers that really is very important to acknowledge. Okay, so let's say that we got rid of this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so for example, if we move, and I'll, I'll show you an, 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 an example of that, but, uh, but if we move into timber structures, then you have another variable of the problem, which is that the material in itself is combustible, so the material can potentially participate in the fire. So in, in many ways, then you have to be a lot more careful about a number of different processes that can happen. So for example, if you ask me, do I need to consider a smoldering fire for a concrete building, and I would say no, because obviously the temperatures that you can attain with a smoldering fire you know, are not a problem at all. So once the fire is smoldering, your temperature decay is, is very rapid, and you have a residual temperature that's extremely low, so the structure starts cooling almost de facto. Okay? The same thing will happen for steel. But if you tell me, do I need to consider a smoldering fire you know, when it's a timber building, Yes, because that smoldering fire can be the source of reignition. You know, and that is the problem. So the problem is not the fact that the temperatures are increasing, but you have all these hot spots that could potentially result in reignition. And then when it reignites, then you're igniting the structure again. Okay? And that has an enormous impact on structural behavior. Okay? So we have to be extremely careful you know, in that particular case, but that is quite a unique scenario if you're dealing with a combustible structure. Fiber reinforced polymers are fundamentally the same, you know, and anything that is a combustible component of the structural system, if it has the potential to participate in the fire, then all these other tail end events like smoldering are very important. Is that okay? So that brings so now we have post flash over and we have localized fires and we've got rid of this one. Okay? Anything else? Any other scenario that you think is of relevance? Let's expand the remit a little bit. Let's assume that this is an open floor plan. Okay, so there's this concept of the traveling fire. And the traveling fire, what it is, is a localized fire that is moving around 
you know, an open floor plan. Okay, so it is. It always behaves. If it always behaves as a localized fire, do I actually need to address this problem? Why not? No, I don't need to consider a localized fire because I can substitute it by an elimination analysis. But what if that localized fire is moving around? Am I going to eliminate every column of the building? Yeah, it takes a lot longer, but potentially has the capacity of literally taking one by one all the structural elements. Is that okay? Non localized fire. So it's really not a localized fire. You know, you were talking about a traveling fire. Okay. So now the question with the with the traveling fire is more, you know, the decision of when does that traveling fire have that form of an impact, okay? In other words, you want to, so if the, if the fire, when it's burning here, it damages and destroys the column, okay? That column then is useless. So when it moves to the next one, and it does exactly the same thing, you know, then that column becomes useless, okay? And so if that is the case, okay, then effectively you have the potential to really destroy the building completely, no? Are we okay with that? So if in a nutshell then, how would I deal with traveling fires? What is the issue that I need to address? Yeah, but it is the spread of the localized fire or the damage that it actually does to the structural element while there. So let's, let's, let me put a different example, okay? So here I am, I'm in next to a column, I'm the fire, I'm burning the column. And by the time I burn out and I move to the next level, my column is still intact. Would the traveling fire then be a problem? Well, but, but no, 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 think. I say, it, does have, it does have to do with time, okay? But is it an issue of the time that it takes to move? Or it is, is it an issue of the damage that it creates while it's burning locally? Of course. Okay, but, but, but of course. You know, what I'm going to be doing is, if a fire can travel, I know it's going to start damaging all the structural elements, okay? But if it actually only takes away 10% of its capacity, and by the time the fire has moved to the next level, it has already cooled down and gone back almost to everything, then would that be a big issue? Not really, no? But on the other hand, if while the fire is there, it creates sufficient damage that pretty much takes that column off, in other words, my elimination analysis, okay? Then would that then be an issue, you know? Because by the time I move to the next one, then I'm taking the next one completely down. And by the time I move into the next one, I'm taking the next one completely down. And then you have one after the other one, all your columns are disappearing. Is that okay? Are we, are we happy with that? So if I was to say that conceptually, the analysis of a traveling fire is actually the analysis of a localized fire, okay? That I'm going to be repeating, okay? But the decision will be made at this point. Is that okay? Because if I know that I have no damage whatsoever, 
Okay? Then there is no point in creating any sort of time-dependent movement of the system because effectively I know the fire is going to be moving and it's going to create very little damage. Now the potential for that being the case is huge. Okay? And the reality is because it is at the stage that it appears as a growing fire. So the temperatures are actually very low. You know, the temperatures of a localized fire are going to be high in a very small area, but fundamentally in the ceiling they're going to be actually pretty low because the smoke layer has a very low temperature at that stage. Is that okay? So the whole preheating of a traveling fire is a possibility and is something that you can actually calculate and you can actually establish to what effect is an impact. Okay, but basically you have cold smoke that is preheating for, for a very long period of time your beams and columns, but the potential of bringing them to a very high temperature is very low because it is a fire that actually behaves almost as a growing fire. Is that okay? So yes, you have to consider a little bit of preheating and you have to consider the effect of the localized fire. So now, going back to the point that I was making, I was saying that if I just have a fire that is not going to move, there is no need to do an analysis because I am eliminating it, okay? If it's a traveling fire, I don't need to treat it as a traveling fire. All I need to do is simplify it and now treat it as a localized fire. This problem is simpler than this one, okay? And I can just treat it as a localized fire. Is that okay? Yep. So effectively, if I do my post flash over fire, number one, and I do my localized fire, number two, establish the level of damage, and if the level of damage is minor, then I really have no problem. If the level of damage is large, I still don't need to do the traveling fire because I have to change something. Okay, if I know that that fuel load is creating massive damage on the structural elements, there is no point in me doing the traveling fire because I know I'm going to be doing this sequentially. So eventually the building is going to be destroyed. Is that okay? So it is never really necessary to do this. Okay, now there's a third event, which is a traveling fire that as it's traveling, it starts growing and becoming more and more and more and more intense. So that will be the growing fire. Okay? That growing fire starts as a very small localized fire, but as it progresses, it starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually it flashes over. Okay? So in that case, how should I analyze that problem? Yeah, so what will be the most severe? The most severe would potentially be the post flash over fire. So effectively, I will have to treat the entire compartment as a post flash over fire. Now, People get a bit confused because the typical techniques that we use, and that's the title of compartment fire, the concept of the compartment fire doesn't apply to a very large compartment, so I'm going to have to use different tools to describe that. Okay? Nevertheless, I should be treating, if I want to bound this, because I don't know, I, there will never be with certainty a possibility to figure out how this thing is going to grow, no? So I'd rather just take it to the end and release all the energy in the entire floor and treat the entire floor as a post flash over fire. So this growing fire effectively is just the post flash over fire. Is that okay? Yep. No, it's just that it's not a series of localized fires. It's a localized fire that is increasing in size. Now, if you, if you look at the problem, so if I look at the floor plan, let, let's take this as a rectangle, okay? And let's say I ignite here, okay? As I ignite, the fire starts spreading with a flame spread velocity. Is that okay? But as it progresses, it's consuming the fuel, 
Okay? So eventually, this part here is going to burn out. So you're going to have a front that has a burnout velocity. Okay? So if the smolder, if the smolder, if the, if the spread velocity is equal to the burnout velocity, then you get a traveling fire. Because you're going to get a certain size of fire that just is moving around. Okay? If the spread velocity is greater than the burnout velocity, okay, then this front is going to be moving faster than what this front can move, in which case the fire is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it gets bigger and bigger at some point, it will produce enough heat that the radiation will ignite everything and the entire compartment goes to flash over. Is that okay? So it's a very, very different situation. Now, a localized fire effectively doesn't have a spread velocity, okay? It's a certain area, fixed area that is burning, and there's nothing here, nothing here. So imagine four cubicles, and then a corridor, a corridor, and a corridor, so the fire can never get beyond that. Is that okay? So there's breaks. So you have a block that is burning, but nothing else can burn, so it doesn't have a spread velocity. Is that okay? And a post-flashover fire has a spread velocity that we are assuming to be infinity because already it burnt everything at the same time. Okay? So these are the two extremes, and these are the intermediate ones. And you have these two options in the intermediate one, one that is growing as you progress, and the other one that effectively the two, the burnout and the burning velocity are moving at the same rate. Is that okay? So those are distinct scenarios that you have. Can you think of anything else? Sorry, can you repeat that? Well, there was no fire in Ronan Point. It was an explosion, so it was purely a mechanical problem. So it eliminated a column. And that was the end of the story. So uh, it was just more an explosion. There was really no fire there. But effectively, it is a velocity of infinity, but not in the case of spread of the solid, okay, which is a fire spread, but in the case of a premixed, so there was a, it was a gas leak. So it was a premixed flame, and therefore, yes, the velocity is infinity, or well, very large. For structural purposes, it's so large that you can assume it's infinity. Okay? So that basically more or less covers it. Is that okay? So yeah, there are other potential alternatives, but that more or less covers all the general possibilities that you could have. And the reality is that you can truly bound everything that you're doing by just simply analyzing this and this. Okay? There are methodologies that allow you to calculate for traveling fires. So if you want to be very sophisticated and come up with a mechanism by which you can assess the progression of the damage, you can do it. Okay? But that doesn't necessarily give you uh, a better solution than what you get here. This might be a bit conservative, okay? because the moment that you're damaging one element, you're saying, I cannot accept this. Okay? While the traveling fires can actually accumulate the damage and say, well, yeah, I'm damaging a little bit and then a little bit and then a little bit, but then now this is cooling. So I can look at the evolution of the structure in time and basically come up with an assessment that might be a bit more refined. And yeah, I can see your skepticism, but it's it is like true. It's more, more like that, that it gains the strength again when it cools. It's probably dependent on the material, right? Of course. It, I mean, that's the whole thing. But then, then if, you're, if you're going to you have to be extremely careful. Yeah. Because basically what you're saying is becoming less conservative because you can predict how all the elements are evolving in time. You know, from weakening to strengthening, you know, from load redistributions, everything as a function of time. And that becomes an incredibly complex exercise from a structural perspective. And, and okay? more, more like, I would prefer to be more conservative and then just yeah. 
then continue in that direction. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, you will not get a job in any of the leading structural engineering companies <laughs> because what they want you is to be less conservative, but. <laughs> yeah, it could, it could have less structural. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, now this, this is becoming quite popular, no? so the use of traveling fires yeah. to try to minimize fire protection you know, it's become quite popular because effectively what you're doing is figuring out the full behavior of the structure to make sure that you are cutting anywhere you can possibly cut. While in reality, if you treat it as a localized fire, you're being more conservative because the moment that you're reducing a certain fraction of the load that you deem unacceptable, or the load carrying capacity you deem unacceptable, you literally stop. Now, as a screening, this should be always done before this. Okay, because effectively you can do this very rapidly, screen what is happening, and figure out if it's worth moving to this one. Is that okay? And the same thing, you know, I could potentially study a growing fire, but I'd rather do this one first as a screening, you know, and make sure that I actually have uh, a proper assessment of how much can it be gained before I embark myself in an incredibly complex you know, mathematical analysis. Is that okay? Okay, so then we have our scenarios. Now, then we need to think of what are the objectives. So what would be the objective if you are designing a very tall building? At all. Is that okay? So in other words, the objective is pretty straightforward. Ts tends to infinity. Is that clear? This is what is called the sign for burnout. Are we happy with that? Yes. Burnout? Ts is the time for structural failure, okay? So it's the time that it takes to fail the structure, and you want that to be infinity. In other words, you don't want the structure to fail. So once the fire has completely extinguished, then it's not affecting the structure anymore, no? So saying Ts tends to infinity, actually what you mean is that Ts has to be greater than the time to burn out. Is that okay? These two things are equivalent. Are we happy with that? So the concept is pretty clear. We are designing for burnout. Okay, we might relax that if we have, you know, a one-story strip mall, okay? A factory, where if the factory goes into a big fire, then it's a total loss, so they don't care if the structure collapses. Okay, so typical design of structural systems of factories have absolutely no fire protection because if the fire goes big enough to affect the structure, that basically means it's already a total loss. So why am I going to waste all this money making the structure robust if it's not a life safety problem because mostly in factories there's a small number of people, they're very easily managed, very rapidly taken out. So effectively, I don't care about the structure, I let it fall down. Okay, so a structure for a factory, I will not design it for burnout. A strip mall, one floor story, I will not design it for burnout. A home, I will not design it for burnout. But any time I start asking for fire resistance, it's because the structure becomes somehow meaningful. And at that point, I am always designing for burnout. Is that okay? So that's a fundamental principle of structural analysis when it comes to fire, that buildings are designed for burnout, okay? Now, if you look at most spaces, yes? So, uh, I understand uh, what you say about the factories that the buildings that have been destroyed in the structure. But uh, can you give uh, the reason why it's also the strip mall? Yeah, because when, when you have uh, a one-story building, obviously your egress times are very fast. So it's not a life safety problem. And the cost of the structure is so low that you, you know, investing in fire protection for an event that is going to be 
low probability event, you know, having a big because you're going to put your sprinklers, you're going to put all the, so if you have a shopping mall, even if it's one story, you have to put sprinklers, you have to put all the protection, but you don't protect the structure. And the reason why you don't protect the structure is because having a fire of size that is big enough to destroy the structure because of all the protection that I have put in place is a very low probability event. So for low probability event, it's not worth spending the money protecting a very cheap structure. Okay? So I let it go. I, and insurance companies are very comfortable letting go those type of structures. The same thing with a home. A home is so small and the cost is so low that they'd rather pay you, you know, to rebuild your house than actually invest in having fire protection all over the place. Okay? That's it's basically just a cost benefit analysis. Okay? So so that's it. So basically, we know what the objective is. We are going to design for burnout. So we're only going to talk about structures that require some element of fire resistance. So we are going to design for burnout. Okay? And these are more or less the scenarios that I need to consider, where in reality, these two become the two scenarios that I'm going to be working on. Now, the localized fire is actually pretty straightforward because you know we have already looked into the the growth of the fire, and we have already looked into how much heat release rate you have. So as a function of that, you can basically take a fraction of that energy and dump it on the structure. Okay? There are many ways to do that, there are ways of doing that, but the reality is that truly what you're doing is you take the energy that you're producing in a fire, you calculate a fraction of that energy that is going to be transferred to the structure, and effectively, that's what you do. A fraction of the heat release rate gets dumped into the structure. And then on that basis, you establish if the structure actually is damaged or not. Okay? So that's a very easy calculation to do. It doesn't really require anything too complicated. The post flash over one is a much more interesting one, and it requires a much more significant type of analysis. So let me get into, into this. So basically, we're going to be talking about the post flash over fire and the characteristics of a post flash over fire and how we can estimate the load that goes into the structural thermal load associated to the fire. Okay? Uh, this is a really interesting picture. Do you know what that building is? It's called the Museum of the Future in Dubai. Okay? And uh, it's now fairly complete, it hasn't been finished yet. Uh, but it, it, that building in particular has a really, really interesting uh, history. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a fully, I mean, it's a crazy building. It's supposed to be a museum. It has the shape of like an oval because this is a hole in the middle and this thing actually comes up like this. So it's basically an, an oval. And, um, and it's formed of all this elements. So it's a diagram, you know, that effectively goes all around the structure. And if you look at the structure here, effectively every structural element as you move around changes in dimension. Okay? Now, if you look at it, it changes in length, but it has a quite an interesting particularity. If you look at them carefully, they actually all have the same cross section. Do you think from the perspective of optimization of a structure, is that a good idea? Well, you don't have constant buckling load. Your buckling load could change. Uh, well, oh, potentially. Yeah. So, so what, what is the problem with designing all the structural elements of the same cross-section? Yeah. Basically, usually, I mean, uh, you don't do that. You just have a usual section as you move uh, high in the building and distribute the load to the substructure. Uh, but you might want that. Uh, 
No earthquakes in Dubai. So, so let, let's, let's, let's think about it, okay? So if I want to use the same cross-section all along, as you mentioned, you have different buckling loads, you have different utilizations of the different components. They're all different. And as you're moving up, effectively, if you have more or less the same dimensions as you're moving up, in principle, you should need much smaller sections, no? Is that okay? That will reduce the weight of the structure, that will reduce the cost of the building, okay? And that will make it the building a lot more efficient, okay? So in this particular case, they decided to make all the sections the same. And if I tell you that they did it because of money, how would that be a money saving? No, st the steel industry doesn't, the, it, for the steel industry constructing a section or another section, it's irrelevant. They sell you steel by the kilogram, okay? That's what you pay. So putting the same cross section in principle forces me to make all sections the same as the one that is mostly solicited, no? So you're literally overdimensioning everything above horrendously. Hold on, there was. Uh, so yeah, I was going to say maybe because so that's going to be basically it's going to be for your workspace. Yeah. In simplest terms, so I guess if your analysis is going to be more expensive than just overspec. Yeah. Expensive. Yeah, yeah. So so clearly, you know, clearly you're overspecking everything, no? So it is a problem, no? You were going to say something. No, no, no. Actually, the, the floors are so high, and it's a museum, that the fuel loads are negligible. And actually, the fire problem got summarized strictly into a compliance issue. Okay? So they wanted to guarantee that they were compliant, and therefore they had a requirement of fire resistance that they had to meet. Okay? So uh, let, me, let me give you the story of this building, because it's quite unique. Uh, I move this, can you see here? So I don't, I don't erase what's, what's in there. Uh, so you, you know you have the problem, so I'll do it up. Hold on. No. What is, it? is that the best angle? It's just that I don't want to erase what's in there. No, no, oh, I know, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using the technology, then I'll put it up. Okay. So effectively, it starts with a structural engineer. Okay, so the structural engineer does an optimization of the design of the diagram. Okay, and of course, they come up to the conclusion that as you're moving along, you know, to get to the top of this egg, effectively here you have very large cross sections. Okay. But as you're moving up, these cross sections become smaller. And when you get to here, the cross sections become very small. And the ones in here are actually tiny. OK? So that is basically the optimization. Structural engineer does that. OK? Then it goes to the fire engineer. OK? And the fire engineer basically prescribes 60 minutes fire resistance, okay? And we'll talk about what that means. So they give 60 minutes fire resistance. In other words, burnout will be achieved in 60 minutes. So you have to have a resistance that can withstand burnout, okay? 60 minutes. Now, that is achieved by means of putting insulation, okay? So you're going to have a steel cross section okay, that has a certain thickness and a certain dimension. And around it, you're going to put insulation of thickness delta. Is that OK? 
So if I have a very big section with a very large mass of steel, okay, the energy that I need to provide to heat it up to a critical temperature is going to be very large, no? Is that okay? So I need to insulate very little because the steel section can absorb an enormous amount of mass. Is that okay? So effectively, for a very large mass, delta is small, okay? So for the insulation, if ms goes up, delta goes down. Are we happy with that, okay? If the mass of steel goes down, delta goes up. Are we happy? Yeah? So then, once this, is, this happened, this was already optimized, and it was optimized for cost, okay? And the optimization for cost was on the basis of the mass of steel, okay? So what did the structural engineer do? They said, well, this is the cost, okay, and this is the mass of steel. Is that okay? So once I optimize all my sections, I know that as I increase the mass of steel, because I'm paying by the kilogram, the cost of my building is going up, okay? So they pushed it and pushed it and pushed it until they finally got to here, okay? And that was the optimal steel cost. Are we all happy with that? Yep. So they sent the optimal steel cost. It went to the fire engineer. The fire engineer prescribed all the fireproofing, okay? And they came up with a new cost. Now it's steel plus fireproofing. So when we look at the problem again, and we're now looking at cost, now it's steel plus fireproofing. Okay? Now, this includes one very important component in the Middle East, okay, which is a uh, labor skill. Okay? In the Middle East, the application of fireproofing is done by people that have very little skill. And therefore, precision on the application is very poor. So it is common practice in the Middle East to apply a single thickness to the entire building. Is that okay? So of all these elements, which one is the one that requires the most? The one in the top, okay? And that defines the thickness that shall be applied. So effectively, the fireproofing is actually the maximum. Okay? So it's basically your maximum delta. And that is what I'm going to apply to every structural element. Is that okay? Yeah? So effectively, we are at this point. The owner says, no way. This is way too expensive. And sends it back to the structural engineer. So the structural engineer does an infinite number of iterations okay, and manages to reduce the cost of the steel by about 4%, okay, and goes back to the client and the client says, that's ridiculous, you need to get a lot more, okay. At that point, a former student of mine who used to work for a, a fireproofing company uh, gets involved in this whole thing and he says, well, think about it, okay, the cost of fireproofing because of the complexity of the application, the smaller the section, the harder it is to apply. So effectively, the cost of the fireproofing looks like this. Okay? So if now, what you do is, instead of having this two and being here, where the cost is actually this, Okay, 
Now, if you actually increase all your section members, okay, in a way such that they're all the same, okay, and we can reduce the delta, okay, and we land somewhere around here, you have saved yourself all this. Okay? 30%. So the cost of the building got reduced in 30%. He got a $150 million contract for the fireproofing and, uh, and effectively got promoted. <laughs> a good end to the story. But uh, you know, two months later, he started his own company. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, so I mean, this is the gain. Okay? This is why this thing is really important and why the dialogue between the fire engineer and the structural engineer is fundamental. Because if you follow the traditional sequence, you are going to land in a non-optimized environment. Is that okay? So that's the reason why that building uh, looks so odd. And effectively, all the structural elements have exactly the same section. And the fundamental reason it is because at the end, the combination of the two materials, that is by far the cheap solution. Okay? So, let's try to understand the problem and see how much do we need to know if we are going to be able to do this type of optimizations. Okay? And that's the real objective of doing this appropriately, is that you understand at the core of the problem so you know exactly how can you optimize the problem? Now, when I say optimize, I'm not talking only about cost, obviously. You're talking about quality of the building, and you're talking about also making sure that you meet the objectives. Okay? The understanding and the conversation between the structural engineers and the fire engineers is essential to be able to achieve that level of optimization. Okay? So are you okay if I go for half an hour, and then we have a break, and then we finish? So maybe we can finish a little bit earlier, because I know that some of you want to go to the city. So uh, let's, let's, let's try to do that. Is, are you OK with that? Instead of taking two breaks, we can take just one? OK. OK. So effectively, that's what led you know, to this particular building and that old design that, in principle, looks so unoptimized. OK? And, but nevertheless, it's actually a truly optimized design. OK? So, the first thing that we need to understand is the existing framework, okay? How did, where are we now? And why there is this lack of communication between structural engineers and fire engineers? And it all dates from this concept of fire resistance. And I already showed you this picture, which is basically the steel, you know, folding on top of the timber building and this need that happened in the 1850s to start thinking on how to protect steel so that it behaves like, like timber. So the approach is called fire resistance, and it was formalized in 1928 by Ingberg, and, uh, and it's remained ever since. So it is based on a series of tests that were conducted between the 1870s and 1920, and then eventually got formalized. There's an absolutely beautiful paper by uh, John Gales, Christian Maluk, and Luke Bisbee that does a historical recount of all this process that eventually led you know, to the fire resistance concept that was eventually formalized by this guy called Ingberg. So anyway, this concept was a very interesting and actually a very well-reflected concept on the basis of very, very simple principles. Because if you think about it, these people were thinking about this at the turn of the 20th century. Our understanding of heat transfer was zero. Our understanding of combustion was completely non-existent. You know, and our understanding of fluid mechanics you know, was extremely, extremely basic. I mean, Lord Reynolds had not really formulated the Reynolds number when people start thinking about these things. So if you really think about it, you're talking about pure intuition with very little theoretical background to try to formulate the problem, okay? The pressure was absolutely enormous because, I mean, you, all you have to do is go to New York and see what the pressure was. People were trying to build tall buildings, building them out of steel, 
you know, was the preferred solution for numerous reasons. So somebody had to solve the fire problem. So many people argue that the advent of tall buildings was because of Otis. You know, when Otis uh, designed the first lift or the first elevator, that enabled us to design very tall buildings because you could carry people up and down in a very efficient way. And it's absolutely correct. So Otis enabled the design of tall buildings. But it was Ingberg who made it happen. Because the bottom line is that everybody was afraid of having buildings falling down because of fire, because steel didn't perform appropriately. So there was enormous reluctance from insurance companies, from the fire services, from everybody, from the authorities, an enormous reluctance to allow taller buildings because everybody was afraid that they were going to collapse because of fire. So it's only as this framework gets formalized that the door gets open for tall buildings to actually happen. Before that, there was an enormous reluctance to allow buildings that were taller than 18 meters. Okay, so 18 meters was a cap. That cap was lifted to about 40 something. And then eventually, you know, once people were more or less comfortable with the way in which fire was being handled, then all of a sudden all these caps were lifted. Okay, now we're moving in a very similar process with tall timber buildings. So until last year, the maximum height of a tall timber building in the United States was four stories. Okay, now is 100 meters. So we have completely released the, the height limits and we are allowing us to build tall, taller and taller and taller timber buildings. Okay, so effectively that's the process. So what is fire resistance? So, yeah. Well, I'll get there. Okay. So, so yeah. I mean, there, there, there are very good and not so good, you know, reasons, you know, for for timber. Okay. And uh, but I'll 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 explain this in little in a minute. So, if you look at the photograph on the top, this comes out from the paper by Gales, Maluk, and Bisbee. Uh, so, if you look at it, this is a typical test of the time. Uh, you can see the poor gentleman here, and you can see the wood. And the poor guy he was charged with throwing as much wood into the furnace as he could possibly throw so the temperatures could be the, the achieved were as high as possible. Okay? So the idea was people were trying to reproduce the hottest possible fire they could create. Okay? So they were varying the size of the openings. They were varying the rate at which fuel was supplied. They were varying the type of wood that was put in there. And they were doing all sorts of variants to try to come up with as hot as possible of a fire. Okay? So many tests were accumulated trying to create this worst case scenario. And effectively what you get is this pool of curves of the evolution of the temperature as a function of time. Okay? Now this is where you see the first misunderstanding of the problem. Okay? Because people are defining energy or heat as a temperature. When we nowadays know that actually temperature and heat should be, sorry, heat should be defined as a heat flux. Okay? And you can have the same temperature but different radiative conditions or convective conditions and you can get very different heat fluxes. Okay? But at the time, the correlation between temperature and intensity was deemed to be correct. So the definition was done as a curve that was temperature as a function of time. So they had a couple of temperature measurements on the inside and they were trying to track down the evolution of temperature as a function of time. Heat flux meters, didn't exist at the time. The concept of heat flux was very vague, so clearly nobody was capable of going anywhere beyond that. So, if you want to get the worst case scenario, what do you do? Then effectively what you do is you take the envelope of all these curves. So the fire resistance curve, or the standard fire temperature time curve, is actually not a fire. What it is, is it's purely an envelope that envelopes all the test data that was available at the time. Okay? It's purely a mathematical function that serves as an envelope of all these events that had been recorded prior to 1928. So in other words, according to the period, 
this was the worst possible fire. Okay? As you can see, the worst possible fire keeps growing to infinity and beyond. Okay? Because nothing was there to stop it. It's just a mathematical function. Okay? So the whole concept of the fuel dying okay, was not included in the worst possible fire. So how would you include the concept of burnout? So if your fire is a mathematical function that keeps burning until the God knows what time, how did, do you define burnout? Okay. Yeah, so you can literally kill the fire at that point, no? Because keep in mind that they're not talking about cooling in the sense that they're not talking about the structure, they're talking about the fire. So the moment the fuel dies, the fire dies. The structure might still be cooling, but that's not what they're tracking. All that they're tracking is the fire. So it's the death of the fire. Is that okay? So how would I quantify that? Create a cutoff time. Uh, how do I create that cutoff time? I mean, how do I quantify it? How do I get a number for it? I look at my samples and see that none of them go beyond 120 minutes. So should I make all fires then 120 minutes? Yep. Potentially, no? So I tried everything, and I will make all fires 120 minutes. So I could say that my worst possible fire for my longest possible duration will give me the most onerous of events. Is that OK? Very extreme, no? But if my structural element survives that, that basically means it will never fail, no? Is that OK? Is everybody happy with that? Yeah. So of course, that was horrendously expensive. So there was a way of optimizing that and trimming it a little bit. How would you do that? Instead of taking the longest fire that you have experienced. Just do an hour. Hmm? Just see at what point it fails in the test. Uh, well, but if you, yes, you could run the test and see when it fails. Okay, but then how do you correlate that to your building and say, okay, in my building is going to fail or in my building is not going to fail? How do I know that the fire in the building is going to last longer or less? Yeah, can we do like an average heat release rate, uh, rate and justify the total amount of fuel that we have in a building by that? Okay, but, but how do you know how much fuel do you have in a building? What's the application? Huh? Okay, but so how would you figure, go and figure that out? So let's say as an office building, how would you figure out how much fuel you have in an office? <laughs> huh? Yeah, no, but that's exactly what happened. So basically this was created by the insurance companies. So the insurance companies sent an army of loss adjusters to effectively establish how much fuel you had in offices. So what they did is they went and measured the amount of fuel in a typical office. They collected all the data for hundreds of offices. They took an average, put two standard deviations, and they were done. There were this many kilograms of fuel in the office. Per, per square meter. Per square meter, of course, yeah. Is that okay? Then they went and did the same thing in hospitals. Then they did the same thing in shops. You know, and they went one after the other one and found the total amount of fuel, okay? So then what they did is they went to the curve that corresponded to the same amount of wood that they had put in, and that's why they call it the wood equivalent, okay? So, and effectively said, well, you know, 10 kilograms of office fuel is equivalent to 10 kilograms of wood, okay? And they went and picked up the curve, and that gave them a time, which is the time to burn out. Is that okay? Of total fuel consumption. So statistically, you determine how much fuel you have available. And then as a function of that, you pick the right curve that tells you how long your fire is going to last. OK? So for offices, then you started creating a requirement of fire resistance. And that requirement of fire resistance is fundamentally the time to burn out. Is that OK? 
and the time to burn it as prescribed from a statistical analysis of the fuel load in that compartment. So instead of using 120, which is the worst, then once you have your curve that is defined by the envelope of all the fires, what you do is you define a required rating by total fuel consumption. Okay? So if you get a hotel room, it burns out in 30 minutes. If you get an office, it burns out in 60 minutes. And they were conservative, so they set it up in gaps of 30 minutes. So if it was 42 minutes, it would be 60. If it was 57 minutes, it would be 60. You know, if it was 61 minutes, it would be 90. Is that okay? And that's it. So all of a sudden, you have the worst possible fire for the longest period of time. Okay? So if I then test my structural element in such a way that it's exposed to the worst possible fire until time to burn out and it still remains intact, then I can actually say that that structural element will never fail. Yes? No, it's exactly the same. I have a very nice plot that shows Ingeberg's plot, and then I plot the ASTM E119, ISO A34, the Australian standards, the Japanese standards, they all fall right on top. We haven't changed the curve at all. Now, clearly, through the years, we have identified that certain fires are more onerous than that, like plastic, certain plastic fires, and so forth. You know, so we have identified that actually that curve is not the worst possible fire. But the concept in itself is so overdimensioned that nobody has been willing to change it because everybody is comfortable that it is way beyond what we need, or at least we pretend that that's the case. Okay? But effectively, that's what it is. So as you increase the fuel load, you have a higher requirement. Now, obviously, there is a risk-based factor associated to it, which is the safety factor. Okay? So if I'm applying this for an office building that is four stories, in the absolute middle of nowhere, okay, my requirement of fire resistance will be 60 minutes. Okay? Now, if I'm designing you know, a 90-story uh, building in the center of New York and it's going to be occupied by the top executives of Goldman Sachs, then my required fire resistance will be four hours. Okay? In other words, they're four times more valuable than the person working in the middle of nowhere. Is that okay? So there's an element of risk that you incorporate to try to increase your safety factors. Yeah? Sorry. And this also affects our cost benefit analysis because if someone for Goldman Sachs died, then the insurance company, when they have to yes. up the life insurance, is going to be much higher because of the loss of income from Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Or else somebody working in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, of course. And, and you know, I'm using Goldman Sachs, but I'm talking about all the buildings around. You know, imagine if, if one of these towers, like what happened with the World Trade Center, collapses. You've basically destroyed an entire sector of a high, high, high cost area. And so the risk element changes your safety factor, but effectively all it is is a multiplier of what we had already decided. Is that okay? So there we are. So now we have a system, okay? Now, but that system has a weakness. And that weakness is very, very simple. I cannot put a building in a furnace, destroy it, and then build it again. So I have to test elements. So I'm testing walls, I'm testing beams, I'm testing all the things. So this is a single element test that I have to be able to extrapolate to the global behavior of the structure. Is that okay? So the way it was defined at the time, it was pretty simple. All they said is, if I heat up a box and that box weakens, all the, I'm assuming that all the loads will be redistributed to the elements that are adjacent. Okay? So effectively what you have is a system where you get a box, that box is heated, you take all the loads of this area here and you redistribute them to all the elements around. Okay? So if all the elements around can take the load, then even if this loses all its strength, that load could be transferred effectively to the other sides and effectively take the extra load with no progressive collapse. Is that okay? So this 
introduces a structural concept, which is the concept of restraint. So you have to have an element of restraint that allows you to transfer the load. So in other words, the elements have to be attached to each other so the loads can go from one side to the other. But also requires that the space has to be compartmentalized. Because if the space is not compartmentalized, then effectively what you're doing is losing strength in the integrity of the floor, in which case you have nowhere to redistribute the loads. So the weakest point of this particular methodology is that it relies very heavily on compartmentalization. Now, obviously, in 1928, nobody cared, because in 1928, all buildings were compartmentalized. Okay? So effectively, it was very suitable for the time. But obviously, by the time we got to the late 30s, you know, already people in Germany were beginning, the Bauhaus movement was beginning to create the open floor spaces. And by the time you get to the 50s in the United States, then you have all these office spaces, you know, that are completely open. And all these principles start weakening, okay? And, uh, and we had to come up with alternatives, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, in a minute. But we had to come up with alternatives. But effectively, it is the restraint that enables me to extrapolate from the single element testing to the global structural behavior, okay? So now I've solved the puzzle. Now, to establish a failure criteria then, effectively what I'm saying is what is a typical factor of safety that a structural engineer will give to the structural elements? And at the time, the values oscillated around two, okay? So what we said is the moment that we lose half of our strength we've entered the space in which the structure is no longer viable, and therefore half of the safety factor, be, or half of the capacity is what becomes the failure criteria. Okay, so you can heat up the structural element until it reaches a temperature where you've lost half of your mechanical strength, and at that point, you have failure. Okay, so basically what you do is you create the curves, here's a first, so you have a big oven, and in that big oven, you put your structural element. In this case, it's a wall, a load-bearing wall, okay? And what I'm going to be doing then is heating up the furnace following the worst possible fire scenario. The structural element oops, will start heating up. And as it heats up, its mechanical properties will drop. So this is, for example, steel and still effectively starts dropping its temperature, uh, sorry, its, its strength, and by the time you get to about 600 degrees, 550 to 600 degrees, most steels will lose 50% of the low carrying capacity. Is that okay? So then that becomes my critical temperature. So now I have a critical temperature, let's say I put 500 for this particular steel, okay, and that gives me the rating or the fire resistance of this structural element, okay? So if that fire resistance is greater than what I need, so for example, if this was a two-story office in the middle of nowhere and I required 30 minutes fire resistance, then I don't need to insulate this structural element. But if I am putting it in a taller building and now I require 90 minutes fire resistance, what I need is to put insulation on the material in such a way that I slow the growth of the heating and this curve actually reaches 500 degrees after 90 minutes. You will always round off, as I said, to the 30 minute below, okay? So if I have 97 minutes fire resistance, that means my fire resistance is 90 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, it depends what you want. So for example, if you have an office and you're designing the partitions, so you're designing it purely for compartmentalization, then probably yes, because the, the, the burnout, the real burnout time is gonna be 15, 20 minutes in a compartment. So effectively having a 30 minute fire resistance is somehow consistent you know, with that. Now, if you have a load bearing member, you know, a, a massive column that holds the entire weight of the building, 
you know, then potentially you would like to have a much bigger safety factor. So I might multiply it by two or by four or by something like that to make sure and guarantee that I'm not losing sufficient strength because the risk is much higher. But, but no, you have to play with that, but potentially yes. Because in an office, for example, a fire cannot last more than 20 minutes. You know, between 15 and 20 minutes, the fire is gone. Okay? So, there you go. That's the whole process. So, why is the large safety factor? Well, we have a very poor understanding of the material behavior at the time. You know, very poor understanding of fire dynamics, so we had really no idea if these were the worst possible fires. You know, so, but fire resistance became embedded into codes and standards, you know, and that became the answer of society for the responsibility to keep buildings standing. Okay? Now, this is the, the, the key part of it, because this is 1928, okay? So now, at this moment, what do the structural engineers say? If this component is tested, and they're putting the adequate thickness of insulation, this component will never fail. Are we happy with that? It will never fail, okay? So it is not the responsibility of the structural engineer anymore. They do not have to do a structural analysis because it will never fail. So the structural engineer remains in their comfort zone and they can design for cold and then insulate. Is that okay? Now, at that point, a series of testing labs like underwriters laboratories and so forth start developing because now somebody had to test these things to make sure that they comply with the fire resistance requirements. And they start publishing their tables. And the table says, if you want 30 minutes, you need 10 millimeters. If you want 60 minutes, you need 20 millimeters. So it was a single table. Okay, so the fire engineers who were very concerned on life safety, and this was post flashover, so it was not a life safety problem, they were very comfortable saying, that is not our problem. Okay? And reading tables, that's perfect for architects, no? You know? You give them the table, they read it, they give you the number, everybody's happy, they give it to the supplier, they put it together, we're all happy. So this is 1928, okay? So the divorce that happened between the professions in 1928 became so extreme that if you go to any civil engineering program almost everywhere around the world, civil engineers will not even take a heat transfer class. As a matter of fact, they won't even need to, they don't even yeah, 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 no, I completely agree. I mean, thermodynamics is one of those sort of general ed classes that you take, that once you are out and you pass your exam, you make sure that you erase every part of it out of your brain, you know, because that's really packed into the useless information sector. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like introductory classes with no actual application, so you, you do not see the impact of the subject to a real application. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you're forced to take it, you get rid of it, end of the story. So a structural engineer really will have no understanding of what is going on when you start heating a structure, okay? Now, in a similar manner, the few fire protection engineering programs that were developed at the time effectively focused 100% on life safety. So if you go to places like Maryland or WPI, which were the original programs, Maryland in particular that started in the 50s, Effectively, it is a fire protection program where they're the t the teaching people how to design alarm systems, fire pro so sprinkler systems, and all these kind of things. It's only in the modern programs that there's been a recognition that structural analysis actually does matter, but even then, it's been received with great reluctance. So for example, I was actually completely shocked when I heard that Edinburgh in the International Masters had taken away the structural class. You know, which is really frustrating. It took me a lot of effort to put it back in. But effectively, these are the, yeah, so the IMFSC students, international master students, don't have to take the structural class in Edinburgh anymore. It's too difficult. <laughs> you know, they want to focus on the fire things. But, but this is a huge divorce, 
Okay, and it's only now that people are beginning to realize what is going on. Is that okay? Now, this is where you get the real problems. What's wrong with these figures? So these figures correspond to the result of four fire resistance tests, okay, conducted with a load-bearing timber slab, cross-laminated timber. In all the cases, the slab is heavily protected with plasterboard, okay? And the objective of the plasterboard is to protect the slab in such a way that it can be treated as a non-combustible material, okay? So effectively, all those four tests passed the 90-minute fire resistance requirements. They, all of them, passed it. Now, what's wrong with those figures? Well, the one in the bottom right has mechanical failure, but the failure criteria was def defined as a maximum displacement. Okay? So it didn't displace itself enough, and therefore it passed. Nevertheless, this particular one, once you remove the fireproofing, actually the timber has not burnt at all. The other ones experienced no mechanical failure. They were thicker, okay? The fireproofing that was put in there was thinner because the structural element now is thicker, okay? And Effectively, they met the other failure criteria. They didn't fail from, because of deflection. Okay? They didn't fail because of the temperature of the back end didn't reach the critical value, which is the failure criteria. So non-exposed area has to reach a certain critical value. Okay? So they all passed. In the website of ETH Zurich, there was a tweet that said, another successful fire resistance test, okay? And they had one of those photographs, actually this one, you know, presented in there. So what is wrong with those pictures? What about the oh, they're all smoldering. For a, they smolder for a very long period of time. These two are after they threw, you know, copious amounts of water on, on, the, on the timber, yes. Okay, but, but you see, you have to be more technical here, okay? What's wrong with those images, technically speaking? Huh? Sorry? No, 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 but, but keep in mind, the method that we're using is single element testing, okay? So this is single element, let's assume that everything else was designed correctly, so the loads are going to be transmitted, and everything is going to be fine. I don't even want to get there, okay? That's even the next level of complexity. Let's keep it simple, okay? So, yes? Okay, so this is the key. So what is the principle of fire resistance? I am going to design, and I have to guarantee structural integrity until burnout. Is that okay? So if the structure, despite the fact that it has a million pieces of plasterboard, ignites and continues to burn, okay, would that give me a guarantee that the building will not collapse? No, because it will continue to burn until it collapses, because the timber has ignited and the timber is burning. Is that okay? So do I have a guarantee that the building is going to withstand burnout? No, because burnout means the entire building has burned down. Are we okay? Now, why is this possible? The reason why is this possible, because if I have a test that requires me to meet a certain set of failure criteria at 90 minutes, do I care about what happens at minute 91? Once the test ends, I take the slab, hose it with water, another success. I mean, you think this is funny. 
I mean, the timber industry spends millions promoting the success of the fire resistance tests without recognizing that it's met all the failure criteria, but it hasn't met the fundamental principle that enables the test. If this thing is going to continue to burn, it will collapse. Is that okay? And therefore, it doesn't meet the criteria of the sign for burnout. Yes? Also, we have material with very different thermal conductivity, so measuring the temperature of some phase, uh, like the anti non default phase. You know, means, uh, let's not get sophisticated. Uh, Okay, I could write a list of a hundred reasons why this is absolute nonsense, and I could use a much stronger word to describe it, but the bottom line is I don't need to. All I need to do is say, this is 91 minutes. Is this burnout? No. Okay? I can start talking about the lamination and showing how this is going to fall apart and start throwing pieces of wood into the fire so the fire will continue to burn. No burnout, okay? So that's at the core. Once you fail this, I don't care about the details. I don't care about the structural behavior. I don't care about the temperature measurement. I don't even care about the failure criteria. All I care is that the damn thing is going to continue to burn until the whole building falls down, okay? So <clears throat> this is a test that was paraded by the Canadians after they finished the Brock Commons, which is an 18-story timber building in University of British Columbia in Vancouver, okay? This was given as the reason and the demonstration that they met all the requirements of fire resistance by putting three layers of plasterboard. This building is one of the most uneconomical experiments that anybody has invented. Not only is it completely uneconomical, but also it's supposed to have all these green credentials of timber. Nevertheless, it has more plasterboard than timber, you know, because not one square centimeter of timber is visible. Everything is covered by endless layers of plasterboard. And nevertheless, when they actually met the fire resistance requirements, this is what came out of the furnace. Is this a guarantee of the sign for burnout? And these are 18 stories filled up with undergraduate students. Yes? And it's in Canada, which has legalized the use of marijuana, so the fire risk has also increased for this specific case. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> then you won't care. <laughs> <laughs> now, as part of, of the proposal to change the building codes in the United States, the international building codes, okay, this is the statement that is written in the proposal that was accepted. This passive protection is achieved through charring at the surface of the wood, which protects the remaining structural sound wood. Isn't that a direct admission that is burning? No, you have a completely different criteria. You have to guarantee that it will self-extinguish. So if you can guarantee that it self-extinguishes. How we can guarantee that if this, we can never do that? Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You know, I mean, I, I, can, I can do another five hours of that. Yes, you can. So there's a whole way of doing it, OK? At this point, trust me, OK? You know, it, it can be done, but it's very difficult, and you have to do it in a very conservative way, OK? What you cannot do is basically not understand what you're doing and doing it all wrong under the premise that you're doing it right. Does this sentence here is by definition wrong. Okay, that sentence should be accompanied with a statement that says only if you can explicitly demonstrate that under the conditions of which you are designing, self-extinction will be attained within X period of time. Okay? And that statement is nowhere to be found, okay? So on that nice note, let's take a 10-minute break and then we can pick up.